Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're taking a look at this fine example of an 1817 common rifle. The Model 1817 Common Rifle was one of the world's first widely issued military rifles and was manufactured by multiple American contractors from 1817 to 1840. R. and J. D. Johnson were the contractors that produced the smallest number of these rifles, only around 3,060 of the 39,067 manufactured per George Moeller in American Military Shoulder Arms Volume 2. By the 1840s, many of these rifles were converted to percussion and used into the American Civil War era. This rifle is 54 caliber and features seven groove rifling with small rounded grooves. US slash AH slash P is stamped on the breech end of the barrel and a J is stamped on the left flat of the breech. 1826 is stamped on the barrel tang with U.S. slash R. and J. D. Johnson surrounding an eagle with a shield at the center of the lock plate under the non-fenced brass flash pan. 1826 Middleton, Connecticut is stamped on the tail of the lock. When it comes to American muzzleloading arms, this is really the first step, I think, after the Revolutionary War era where we start to see America defining its own military arms. Now there are still, as I've stated before, a lot of French influences in this piece, but we're really getting into the American military and American designers shaping what American military arms are going to be with the 1817 common rifle. I wanna talk really quick about some of those similarities to the French arms, mainly the model 1766, which became the American Springfield later on. When we look at our iron furniture on this piece, that's a big giveaway for us. We've transitioned now out of brass hardware, like we saw on uh, some of the Committee of Safety muskets going into early American Revolutionary War arms. So we have an iron butt plate here. We have a notched and rounded tipped butt plate here with a single screw at the top and then a screw back here at the bottom third of our butt plate. When we compare this butt plate design to some of the earlier French military arms, you'll notice a lot of similarities, but as I stated, we're starting to see some changes. Moving up here to our lock plate, our cock or hammer is still very much of that French design. We've lost some of the ornamentation and we're starting to shrink a little bit here, especially our overall lock length, we're getting down into thinner locks, a little bit smaller locks as manufacturing becomes better and durability of materials, in my opinion, becomes better. So we're starting to see that shrink as we see in civilian arms for the time. Uh, when we look at post 1800 flint lock mechanisms, especially uh, coming in from Europe, especially on English arms and, and French arms and the American locks, of course, as well. We start to see that lock architecture shrinking a little bit and, and changing over time. Moving forward with some similarities here, we still have our three barrel bands and we have our front sight now has moved off of our front barrel band and is now integrated uh, into the barrel like we see on other military arms. Certainly not all of the similarities we're mentioning here, but you'll notice that our side plate design is just about the same side plate, at least in design shape wise, as we see in the 1795 Springfields and is as seen on earlier French military arms. Just some interesting notes I like to make on this as we see the transition and see the changes across standardized American arms as we go into here now, the 19th century. Starting with our butt stock and moving forward, as I said, we have an iron or steel butt plate here. We have two large round headed screws here holding our butt plate in. We've lost a lot of our pronounced crest here at our butt stock. And this is something that you're going to, going to continue to see change through American arms manufacturing. You're gonna see that crest change quite a bit, especially once we get into the cartridge era. Um, very commonly when we think of the Henrys and the Winchesters and the Remingtons of the period, we've, we're about to like this as far as shape goes. We still have a lot of drop here that we will lose in American military arms over time. 
but um, we still have some of that distinctive shape and our sharp point of our crest here. On the side here, you'll notice that we have the addition of a patch box here on the common rifle. We have several designs of this, to my understanding, through the period, but this is just a simple oval iron patch box here. Really nice design. It takes up much of our buttstock here, making it a very utilitarian patch box in the field. I'm going to pop it open here. We have a release at the top of the patch box here. You can see gently springs open. It does not launch like we see in some other patch boxes out there. But here you can see we have a seven knuckled hinge here. And our patch box features a slight dome to it to follow the contours of our stock. Our inner spring is found here at the bottom of our patch box and gently curves up here to catch the hinge area here. We have a slight raised up section where I believe the hinged portion of the patch box was rolled over a pin or rod here to form the hinge section on this box. Our spring pressures that folded or bent area to open up the box. I'm not sure when, but it could have been in manufacturing. A neat detail about this patch box. So if we look very closely, we can see even scratched lines around the exterior of this box, I believe to have been made by a file during the manufacturing process. Kind of interesting to see those worker notes still in here. And if we look across what would be the top of the patch box lid here, as it's facing us if we were holding the rifle, we do see some vertical nicks in this box running perpendicular to the direction of the box. This could be hammer marks used to shape this box in a form uh, or on a bench here. These are very fine, very almost planished marks here that have since taken rust, but um, they're similar marks to what we see in hand hammered patch box lids and pieces in contemporary muzzle loading. So that could be a notion, a little, some marks left behind by the makers of the box. Like many patch boxes and many internals on these muzzleloaders that we see, especially in originals, we don't see much of finish applied at all to the inside of the patch box area. And that extends here, I believe, to the interior of this patch box lid where we can still see some of those maker's marks on the inside that aren't necessarily present on the outside here. This has been sanded smooth or filed smooth or polished. Like we know are in the military ordinances for production muzzleloaders like this one, a high degree of polish was expected when these muzzleloaders were shipped. And oftentimes the carriers or owners of these muzzleloaders in the field were expected to keep them cleaned and polished each day they were in the field. On the note of not seeing much finish on the inside of the patch box lid, there is no evident finish here on the inside of our patch box. I bring this up a lot. I want to highlight that in this piece here, because even though this is a finished military, contract military arm for the period, we don't see the same level of finish applied to the interior of this patch box as we see on the exterior. Oil or finish could have been applied to this box in previous years and has since worn or dried out. I do not personally think that is the case. This looks to me like old dry wood here inside this patch box, meaning that this could have been shipped or produced without any finish here. Just something for the contemporary builders at home to make note of, depending on what kind of finish you're going for. The form of the patch box here was made, we believe here, to have been made with four drill bits in line here, affecting or, or making out the lower curvature of this box. We don't necessarily see those same drill holes towards the top of the box, but this amount of drilling could have given the maker enough room to come in with a chisel. Um, and we do see some tool marks here at the base of the patch box as well as on the walls of the patch box that to me denote the use of a chisel uh, in cleaning out the wedges left by a round drill bit and perhaps some chisel marks to further flatten out or work the bottom surface of this patch box. Notably here towards the rear, we have some chisel marks in the end grain um, that to me resemble marks that could have been made by a chisel coming in lengthwise across the box and then stopping at the back of the box um, after cutting uh, an amount of wood 
off the base. Really neat, really simple little patch box here. I really love boxes like this. <laughs> the construction of this box I'm spending a lot of time on, but when we look at the bottom side here of our hinge, like I said, we have seven knuckles here. The bottom part of the hinge is also folded over, or those knuckles are folded over, and is held into the patch box with two screws. I don't believe that the bottom spring for this box is held in at all. I believe that this spring goes back in and then wraps underneath the internal hinge here for a patch box and is kept in place just with pressure and those screws that hold in the hinge on the patch box. We have a slight wobble to that hinge, which makes me think um, that's how this is constructed. That means for very simple construction and as few fasteners as possible, it takes time and it takes skill to produce screws even in the early 19th century here. So any part where you can get away with a pressure fit or these screws that hold in the box itself holding in that spring uh, make for a cheaper and a faster production model. Our patch box release spring up here is held in with its own small screw. This whole spring is inlet into the stock inside the patch box here. Like I said, this is a really tight, really functional patch box. That's just crisp. I'll just let you listen to that raw. I mean, how good is that? It doesn't get any better in my opinion. The overall fit of the box, um, there is some variation between the surface of the lid and the box, but as that is to be expected, I think. Um, patch boxes are, are seldom perfect, especially with time, as wood adjusts with humidity. This box itself won't necessarily change a whole lot um, just by existing, but the wood can change over time. Running forward here on the underside, once again, we have a round toe on this stock. It's a very durable toe shape, and like I have said in previous videos or other videos, uh, it's very common in American military arms through the entirety of wood stocks on them, really. We're seeing a different trigger guard design here than we saw in the American Revolutionary War arms. For one, this trigger guard is made of iron. Um, but two, we are seeing the sling stud move from the front of the bow here to the rear here in kind of our hand guard area. We've made the transition out of European inspired, I would, I would say, or, or earlier inspired trigger guards, and we're now shifting into a trigger guard design that becomes very common for the entirety of the 19th century and really into the early 20th century on wood stocked arms. You'll notice that we have our primary bow here and then we have our hand catch back here that you could argue will transform into the pistol grip section that we see on, on many arms today. Moving forward in our um, really shortened wrist and, and shortened length of pull in comparison to some other muzzleloading rifles that we see, um, it's very common, I think, in, in my opinion, for the military or standardized arms through time here. But we have uh, kind of a, a hybrid between a a round-faced lock here. We have kind of a, a round-faced tail on this lock like we see in early standardized muzzleloading arms. And then we have a slight bevel here at the front and a very flat face. Like I said earlier, we have our hammer or cock design, very French in design, very French inspired, we'll say. We've all but lost our tail up here at the top rear of our cock or hammer. It has molded into just a utilitarian um, pin really that holds or, or indexes our top jaw with our top jaw screw here. Our top jaw screw, like some of the earlier standardized muzzleloading arms, features a hole running perpendicular through the, the bolt as well as a slot across the top here for a turn screw to fully tighten or efficiently tighten our top jaw to our leather and flint. As noted previously, we have some stamped markings here at the tail as well as just forward of our hammer underneath our frizzen. The frizzen is made out of a section of cast brass, which we see in, and we've mentioned some in uh, the brass barreled standardized or military arms for the flintlock period because brass does not corrode in the way that iron does. So we see in some American military arms for the black powder period and the flintlock period within it, we have the pan being made out of that brass to help fight corrosion when used in the field. With our locks themselves, our lock mortises and our side plate mortises begin to start to shrink in this period. We have less and less definition 
with them and less and less thickness in them across the breech face. Our breech area for this piece is unadorned. We do have the US, AH, and P stamps here in the breech, but no real decoration. Stepping back onto the tang, we have 1826 stamped, and then we have our single tang bolt here, securing our barrel assembly to the stock here in the rear. Coming around on our side plate side of the barrel, we have some rather coarse file marks here. I'm not sure when or how these were applied to this barrel, if they are original or a modification, but they are very aggressive here. Along with that, on either side, of this breech, although it is a fully round barrel. Back here towards the breech section, um, about at our lock plate and side plate mortise to the rear, we have the sides of the barrel flattening out to set into or be inlet into the barrel here. Forward roughly five and a quarter inches from our front lock bolt here, we do have our inset rear sight. This is just a simple uh, V or notch rear sight here. Um, set into our barrel. It's on a rectangular plate that has been roughly dovetailed. And when I say roughly, I just mean it's not a, uh, it's a very shallow dovetail, I should say, not rough. It's been set into the center of the barrel in line with our front sight, which I believe is it's set in a similar way. It could be that these sights are applied with some sort of solder or brazing in addition to a, a little bit of metal fitting here. I mentioned dovetailing only because there is some material removed from the top of our barrel here to accommodate our sights setting in. These sights are not as set in. They're not as far into the barrel as we see in some earlier arms and as we see in civilian arms, even into this period. We're getting, I believe here, <laughs> to a very utilitarian style of manufacturing for these arms. You've got your rounded barrel and you still have your, your rectangular sight base here. It's not been filed away to match with the profile. We're getting away, I think, at this period from the artistic nature of it. And you're getting more into the utilitarian, more industrial design aspect of it as far as manufacturing goes. And again, that's just personal opinion there. Forward of our rear sight, we have our first barrel band. We have our second barrel band, and then we have our third barrel band at the front. Again, as far as French influence goes, that barrel band is a modified, shrunken version of the barrel bands that we see in earlier American military arms, and with those, French military arms of the black powder and flintlock era. Our barrel bands here are small. They're very thin. They look as if they've been formed on the stock and barrel for this piece. We're very limited in excess material here. I believe at this point we're understanding a little bit more the amount of use that these pieces are going through and we can better uh, use the material that we have in manufacturing along with knowing what the rifles are going through to save time and money with using less material where it can be, where it can be less really. Uh, we still have our spring loaded barrel band release here to the front of the barrel band and we've foregone the entirety of ramrod pipes in this piece and we're into an era where we're exclusively using those barrel bands as our ramrod uh, pipes. Our stock itself here is also almost fully encapsulating our ramrod like we see in later or mid to later 19th century arms here, where we just have an exclusive slot for our ramrod here. And there's not really even room to grab that ramrod. The, the tolerances are so tight there. Using the stock itself to hold the ramrod in, not relying on those pipes. Our middle barrel band features a similar release to our rear, and we have our integrated sling swivel on the underneath here. Pulling our ramrod out here, you'll notice that we have the appropriate brass tip for this model of manufacture. Something interesting about this is we have, again, more uniform tool marks on this brass ramrod. I'm not sure if that comes from continued use of this piece or if somebody over time has grabbed that tip with a pair of pliers um, and possibly unthreaded the brass end. The other end of our ramrod, the narrow end, is fitted with some fairly tight threads, which is in contrast uh, greatly 
to the late 18th century threads that we see on earlier uh, standardized contracted military muskets for the time. Very interesting little details there. Uh, the barrel itself, as I mentioned earlier, is a 54 caliber and features seven grooved shallow round bottom rifling. And that's a big distinction for us as we're going to the 19th century. The military is beginning to get away from the idea of needing to only use smooth bores. Rifling technology is becoming affordable and standardized, and they're able to utilize that for military arms here in the, in the United States and other countries as well. Our side plate side is very much the same as in many of these standardized muzzleloaders. Um, back here though, to our side plate side, we do see some of that variation. We have our two large lock bolts here. Our side plate is an iron side plate. You'll recognize the shape if you've looked at earlier American and then French military arms. It is, it is just about the same. Uh, there may be some variation here between these in size and, and curvature and, and degrees of angles and things, but we still see this side plate design continuing to be used you know, 20, 30, 40 years uh, really after the French arms um, of the period were using this same piece, which is, which is very interesting. Um, I'm not sure if there was just a surplus of those side plates or if it was just an appreciation of them, perhaps. Uh, more study for myself is absolutely needed in that regard. And again, if you are an expert in that field of study or, or know about that, please chime in and, and let me know. Um, I'm fascinated while we see so much change through the eras in these pieces, we see things like those side plates continue on. Coming back now to our wrist and our buttstock, we have a plain unadorned buttstock here. No decoration, no carving, no cheek rest. It's just simple and plain. It's common, it's basic, it's all you need. Um, and again, it's a design that you're going to see prominently through the 19th century. Uh, it won't be exactly, it's not going to be a duplication of this, but we are getting away now in this period from a lot of the established motifs that we saw, at least in civilian arms. In the military arms side of things, no, you, you never really saw the cheap pieces. Um, it just wasn't very common. Um, but you start to see this more and more through American firearms development in this period. And I firmly believe it, it is at a basis uh, of arms like this one. They laid the foundation for those designs, for that manufacturing of those designs, and allowed those shapes and principles travel through time, really, regardless of manufacture. It's kind of neat. That's just my personal opinion on it, though. Overall, I think a really neat example of a flintlock 1817 common rifle from this period. Uh, again, uh, from a set of makers that did not produce a whole lot of the almost 40,000 of these produced. Um, so we have a little bit of uniqueness there in the manufacturing side of things. I'm a big fan of this patch box back here. Really great, I think. Uh, it's nice to see that on one of these pieces. And overall, um, just a, a real fine example where it still remains bright um, and, and functions. I mean, it's, just, it's always neat to hold a piece of history like this in my hands. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to share this piece with you here today. If you'd like to learn more about this and the other antique arms going through the halls here, I encourage you to check out the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages to learn more. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.